So to begin, yeah, I am going to send you a link. It's a little bit long. It's like seven minutes or so because this is your first time watching 90 Day Fiance. Anything having to do with 90 Day Fiance, right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. I'm just curious, like, why are you interested in this? Like, why Watch should the someone clip, care? Julia. Why should someone <laughs> care? We start today with correspondent Tracy Hunt guiding me into the unknown. The world of reality TV. Okay, so Julia, 90 Day Fiancé is this wildly popular show on TLC. It's about couples who are international. Like, it's usually one person lives in America and the other person lives somewhere overseas. And I want to begin your 90 Day Fiancé journey with one couple in particular, Colt and Larissa. Okay, I'm going to—do I hit play? Yes, hit play. My name is Colt. I'm 33 years old. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're in Las Vegas, Nevada, and we're at the airport, and we're meeting Colt and Larissa. Colt is um, a white guy in his 30s. He lives in Las Vegas. I am Larissa, 31 years old, from Minas Gerais, Brazil. And Larissa is from Brazil. She's also in her 30s. And they met online. They went on vacation together to Cancun, I think. And Mm -hmm. after five days of this vacation together, Colt asked Larissa to marry him. And so she said yes. After one date, they decided to get married? Yes, effectively one date. So what what we're doing right now is that we're meeting Larissa for the first time. She's just flown into Las Vegas. And this scene is basically her first impressions. First impressions of Las Vegas, right? Yes. Okay. Hair is hot. I want air conditioning. It's going to get a little hotter, too. Oh, my God. I can feel the, 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 the hot, warm. First of all, she's hot. It's not the same sort of warmth in Brazil. I've been to Brazil. I know the difference between <laughs> desert heat and beach heat. <laughs> <laughs> and I know which one I vastly prefer. <laughs> My first goal in America is marry. Second, apply for the green card. And third, buy a car with air conditioner. <laughs> I thought that was more big, you know? It's pretty big. Like New York. Las Vegas is also this thing that's exported to the rest of the world and through our movies and television shows, Ocean's Eleven. Like, you get this idea that it's like this really glamorous, glitzy, big city, you know, American dreams, blah, blah, blah. Tall buildings, big lights, like casinos. Casinos, yeah, exactly. My first impressions of Las Vegas, not a city that I expected. I confused Las Vegas with Beverly Hills, Hollywood, and New York. It's not like the, the movies. And so you see her, like, get out of the car. She's still very hot. She's still very uncomfortable. And she's like, oh, here's a sign. And this is, like, the world-famous Las Vegas sign. It's on postcards. It's on magnets. It's everywhere. And it was actually surprising to me because I also didn't realize it was that small. Are you going back to Brazil? <laughs> no, no. What are you sorry? It's here it's so warm. It's not in my American dream. This is America. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think that there's just like a lot more going on here other than just like a disappointed woman coming from Brazil. I think it's like way bigger than that. And so, like, back me up for a second. Like, why is the show called 90 Day Fiancé? Well, it's called 90 Day Fiancé because if you're an American person who wants to marry somebody from another country and you want to bring them to the United States, you can bring them to the United States on something called a K-1 visa or a fiancé visa. And that gives that person permission to come to the United States to get married. But they have to do it within 90 days. And so... At least how it functions in the world of this TV show. I'm sure it's different for a lot of couples. You're going to spend those 90 days not only planning a wedding, but just like getting to know each other better and figuring out whether or not you could actually live together and whether or not this is what you want to go through with. So what you're saying, like 90 Day Fiancé is a TV show based around this one 
piece. I really like this one clause in U.S. immigration policy. Yes. I I did not realize that. Like, I, I guess I've always... I, I The thing that I don't like about reality shows is that it's like, they're sort of contrived. It's like, oh, 90 days to fall in love. And it's like, that's not the way the world works. But in this case, like, it is the... <laughs> it literally <laughs> is the way the world works. Like, the U.S. government came up with this premise. Yes, yes. And Julia, because you haven't been watching reality TV, you've been missing a very important lesson about U.S. immigration policy. <laughs> and, and I think this show is also, like, a really good textbook example of Americans' relationship with the world and how the world sees Americans. This week, correspondent Tracy Hunt, our resident reality TV expert, watches one of the biggest shows on television and tells the story of how love got written into U.S. immigration law. I'm Julia Longoria. This is The Experiment. Okay, so new couple. This is Big Ed. I'm Ed. I'm 54 years old. People know me as Big Ed. I'm from San Diego, California. And I am a professional photographer. Big Ed, American white man in his 50s. He actually gave himself the name Big Ed. It's funny because I'm not tall. I'm actually 4'11". And then there's Rose, who is much younger. She's 23. My name is Rose, and I'm 23 years old. I live in Caloacan City, Philippines. They met on Facebook, and they've had their relationship just on Facebook and, like, texting and calling. And he's traveling to the Philippines to meet her and her family and hopefully fall ever more deeply in love with her and ask her to marry him. Yeah, okay. (laughs) I spent the night at Rose's home. And in this scene... Big Ed is waking up after spending the night in Rose's house. And this was one of the worst nights of my life. I am completely drained. I haven't slept. The mattress that I slept in was soaking wet. This was the first night I've ever spent without access to air conditioning, and I hated it. And I feel broken. This is just, like, so, so (laughs) deeply uncomfortable to watch. (laughs) So, like, a lot of the show is cringe. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, like, walk me through what's happening here. Okay. So, throughout the time that he's in the Philippines, you know, there's, like, a scene where he's, like, asking her to shave her legs because he doesn't find her feminine enough for him. Or he makes a comment about her breath and gives her toothpaste and toothbrush. But then it comes out that she actually has had an ulcer for many years, and that's what's causing her breath. And she's actually really self-conscious about it, and she brushes her teeth all the time. But on top of all that, Ed travels to the Philippines from San Diego, like something like six, 7,000 miles. And he goes there because he's going to rescue Rose from this situation, this poverty that she's in. And he's already been doing that. He's been, like, sending money to her and her family to help them out. But from the second that he's in the Philippines, he's so completely helpless. And she's the one that ends up having to rescue him this entire trip. Why I find this so interesting is just, you know, to see this kind of power dynamic play out. And also, like, it's just also really interesting to see the disconnect between how Americans see themselves and how the rest of the world sees Americans. And so on this show, you see men like Big Ed. They say they lost hope that they could ever find a partner in the U.S. So they turn to international dating. And this is not just some, like, bizarre reality TV show setup. Like, there's a whole industry built around this kind of relationship. Marriage is one of those ways in which women have, for many, many generations and decades, used marriage to get ahead Felicity Amaya Schaefer is a professor of feminist studies and critical race studies at UC Santa Cruz. She's also the author of the book, Love and Empire. Way before 90 Day Fiancé, Felicity became interested in how immigrants were using marriage to cross the border into the U.S. 
Over three years, she talked to dozens of men and women who were interested in these kinds of relationships. I ended up in Colombia and Mexico interviewing women and men at these vacation romance tours about why they were interested in dating someone. Wait, Um, what's a vacation romance tour? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So that is um, these sort of big social parties that different companies host so that men from the United States and Canada can travel to Latin American countries and meet women in a big social event. So here's what Felicity discovered. Say you're a woman in a foreign country interested in marrying an American man. You might contact one of these international dating sites and they'll get some photos of you and include some of your stats. Their weight, how tall they are, all kinds of personal information, and then their contact. The company then compiles these packages filled with these photos and contact information for all these women into these, like, digital catalogs. And American men can look through them. And if they see someone they like, they could email them. And then usually they'll all come together for these big sort of social parties. And it's a quick way to meet lots of women and for the women to be introduced to lots of men all in one place. Which is where Felicity would show up asking questions. Part of this that I'm also interested in is the fantasies that foreign women usually have of life in the United States and vice versa. You know, men sort of think that U.S. women are much too feminist and too modern and too independent. And they think that they're going to find something very different in Russia, Latin America, you know, wherever it is, Asia. And so they often are surprised that women um, are very strong, have strong personalities, they need certain things, and that they don't want to usually live in rural areas. Did you peer into the dark heart of American masculinity? Yes. What'd you see when you look, when you paired into it? Oh my God. (laughs) I mean, so many insecurities Given the way in which desire is so entwined with status and money, you know, it's it's a sad structure, that sort of capitalist context in which certain people become no one if you don't have some game. I have this amazing interview with a guy who said to me something that really clarified things. He said, you know, in the United States, I'm just the average Joe. But when I cross the border, I become Tom Cruise. It was hard in some ways, and I felt really creepy. And then it was also sad, you know, to see that there's so many lonely people that are just sort of in the shadows um, that can't meet anyone and just like really want to connect. And these women are just desperate to come to the United States and that the men in some ways broker their ticket to getting here. Have you ever watched 90 Day Fiancé or heard about it? Uh, yes, I have watched some of the episodes, you of watched- course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it's hard to watch too many. I never thought I would get married. All my previous relationships have ended with me getting a broken heart. After having- Watching 90 Day Fiancé, I got this feeling that for a lot of the cast, they might actually believe that A shot at the American dream is all they have to offer in exchange for love. Here's Colt, the guy who lives in Las Vegas. After having struck out a few times online with American girls, I thought maybe I could search outside the country, maybe find a girl. But as Americans put themselves on the international marriage market, hoping to find someone more beautiful, more loyal, more grateful, if that love turns out not to be true they also have the power to take that American dream away. Which brings me to one couple I think about a lot, Ashley and Jay. My name is Ashley. I'm 31 years old, and I'm from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Ashley's in her 30s. She's white, blonde, pretty, and a mother of two from Mechanicsburg, a town in Pennsylvania where more than 90% of the residents are white. While vacationing in Jamaica, she meets Jay, a black 20-year-old tattoo artist. I went to Jamaica with a group of friends and family to a big wedding. And um, one night we decided to go out to a bar, and that's where I met Jay. Ashley says she's been cheated on before, and Jay more or less admits that being faithful is hard for him. But when he proposes, she says yes. 
They file for the K-1 visa, and soon he's on a plane traveling to live with her in America. But Ashley admits that she hasn't really thought about what that might mean for Jay, to live in a mostly white suburb. I'm hoping we don't have to deal with any racial issues, but I'm also very naive to all of this. Ashley and Jay get married, but shortly after the wedding, she finds out he had sex with another woman. So she calls him on the phone to confront him. If you show up at my house, the police will be waiting to deport your ass. I don't give a I do not give a He has to sit and rot in jail until they deport his ass. I don't give a And just like that, Ashley goes from being this naive white woman who doesn't understand race in America to a white woman asking the police to remove her disappointing Black immigrant husband from her life and from her country. I don't want him near me. I don't even want him in this country. He's here illegally. He needs to go back to Jamaica. Some of this ugliness, the icky gender and racial dynamics, the heartbreak, this is just classic reality TV show stuff. But... This particular drama of the 90 days and the K-1 visa started way before reality TV. For one thing, you know, I just kind of looked at the Wikipedia history of the K-1 visa, and I was kind of surprised to see that the Vietnam War had something to do with it. Yeah, I mean, it actually has a lot longer history, I would say, than the Vietnam War. After the break, How love got turned into a visa application. The journey to 90 Day Fiancé is a long and winding one. As much as it's a story about love across borders, it's also a mini-drama about who we think is worthy of marriage and citizenship and who has the power to decide. Felicity Amaya Schaefer, she's a professor at UC Santa Cruz who did research on so-called romance tours, told us that one of the earliest immigration laws ever passed in the U.S. was about romance, or at least sex. From the very moment that the federal government became involved in immigration, you see the influence of biases of race. The law is called the Page Act. Passed in 1875, it restricted the migration of Asian laborers to the United States for, quote, immoral purposes. And it was primarily enforced against Chinese immigrants, but more specifically, Chinese women. If you were the wife of a wealthy Chinese merchant, you could come to the United States. But if you were a lower class woman, you could not come. And this has to do with trying to prevent laborers from migrating and bringing women that they thought would destroy the values of the United States. U.S. lawmakers assumed that poor Chinese women coming to the United States were coming here to be sex workers. This created some of the legislation that women had to have medical examinations before migrating. Why were they having them do medical exams? Chinese women were assumed to spread venereal diseases because they were assumed to be prostitutes. Women had to have that kind of medical exam before they were allowed entry. The law was eventually changed to allow more foreign women into the United States. But that's because American men demanded it. Starting with the Philippines War in the late 1800s, American men were going all over the world, fighting wars and colonizing, and in the meantime, meeting women they wanted to bring back to the U.S. and marry. After World War II, thousands of American men wanted to bring women back from Europe and Asia, but couldn't because of immigration quotas. So Congress passed the War Brides Act. This was a kind of pathway for men to bring back wives and There was like 300,000 women that came. It made it easier to bring the spouses of American military members back to the U.S. But the War Brides Act was only in effect for about three years, 1945 to 1948. And as the Vietnam War began to wind down, American soldiers who once again wanted to bring more foreign wives back to the U.S. started demanding a more permanent solution. So... 
1970 was when the K-1 process was actually finalized. But the relatively clear, simple, and quick path to permanent residency and eventual citizenship offered by the K-1 visa has alarmed American politicians over the years and led to panics about marriage fraud. There were all kinds of media accounts about these sort of marriage ring frauds that were allowing people to come in from Havana and all these subversive types that were using marriage as a way to sort of skirt the usual immigration structures and enter into the country. And I think during the wars, it was a more clear understanding of how people met and the conditions through which people met. So the soldiers were going overseas, falling in love, bringing women back. Now, when in the absence of that, it's like, wait, why are these women coming here? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is their motivation for coming here? I think that's the next big phase is already the presumption of fraud after the Vietnam War. I'm going to examine this issue of immigration marriage fraud. Resulting in things like this, a Senate committee hearing on marriage fraud in 1985. Here's Senator Alan Simpson. We're going to inquire into the nature and extent of this situation determine whether we see but another way of gimmicking our generous, very generous, legal immigration laws. And this led to a new immigration law. It made the green card immigrants got after they got married conditional. You didn't get a permanent green card until after you had been married for at least two years. Suspicion of immigrants continued well into the 90s. But the narrative changed to one where immigrants were now an economic liability. Because, you know, that's always the language about immigrants, right? That they're a drain on the economy, that they're always taking from and, you know, using these precious resources that should go to citizens. So the K-1 visa changed again. In 1996, President Clinton signed a new rule into law. Starting now, Americans who brought a spouse to the U.S. on the K-1 visa were now legally responsible for that person for 10 years. Even if they divorce. He is taking up responsibility to make sure that she can live, even without a job, for the remainder of 10 years while in this country, if she decides to stay. Wow. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Is, a, that is a huge shift. Yeah. That, that's huge. Yeah. It sounds like it's to discourage people from doing this, is what it sounds like. Yes, that is an entirely huge shift. And men came to me complaining about that over and over again. As part of her research, Felicity spent a lot of time on listservs for men interested in marrying foreign women. When this rule was put into place, she watched as they began to freak out, asking each other about potential red flags. It was everything from, you know, she doesn't want to have sex till we get married. Is this a red flag? Is she affectionate enough? Is she uh, hot and sexy in bed? Like, does she ask for money? That was a big one that would come up. And so then women, you know, didn't have the benefit of this kind of community, but would often talk to me like, I feel really like I can't ask him for the things that I need because he seems so suspicious of me. Mm. So, you know, it really did affect um, what they could say to each other, how they would read each other's actions. Felicity says the threat of financial consequences for a bad marriage with a foreign spouse may have made these kinds of relationships even more tense. And so I think that part of that shift in the K-1 visa structure led to actually, or maybe facilitated more abusive relationships because the men were so skeptical and sort of adopting the, the view of the state. In 2000, Anastasia King, a 19-year-old originally from Kyrgyzstan, was murdered by her American husband after she was brought to the U.S. on the K-1 visa. It's impossible to say for certain whether the pressure and suspicion that increased after changes to the K-1 visa increased the level of violence in these kinds of relationships. But in response to this abuse, Congress realized it also had to protect immigrant spouses. 
So it passed the International Marriage Brokerage Regulation Act, or IMBRA, in 2005. Where men have to provide criminal records and women have to have their rights. I spoke to a couple of immigration attorneys who told me immigrant women are still afraid that if they report their American husbands for abuse, they'll be deported. Though there are provisions within IMBRA and the Violence Against Women Act to protect them. Even still, women in the U.S. on the K-1 visa, separated from family and community and unable to legally work, are often left vulnerable. Today, as part of the K-1 application process, the foreign fiancé has to sit for an interview with an American consular official who's trying to find out whether your relationship is real or a scam. You're asked about your American partner's birthday, education, family, But you're also asked to maybe describe your engagement or whether you're planning to go on a honeymoon or what kind of wedding you're going to have. In other words, are you here for the right reasons? Do you really love this person? How do you express your love to Cole? To show love. For me, it's clean the house. Those interviews with counselor officials are never caught on camera. But you can kind of get an idea of how they might go watching friends and family on 90 Day Fiancé question the would-be foreign spouse. Here's Colt's cousin John asking Larissa to prove she loves Colt. You're not just coming over here to marry my man for a green card, are you? I'm with him because I love him. Honestly, John was acting like a policy or immigration officer. He was really rude to me. The United States is about choice and equality and democracy. So it's interesting to think about how romance sort of um, sits in for all of these other values of a democracy. Like, are you capable of consenting to this? Or if you come from a poor background, are you forced into this because you have no other recourse? that you really choose this person because you love them and not for any other reason. So it's this sort of divorcing of economic questions from romantic ones. So, Julia, what do you think? I mean, (laughs) this is, like, what's so appealing and repulsing about reality TV, right? Like, watching this desperation on all sides play out like a car accident, you know? Um, Are they here for the right reasons? Will they actually be truly in love? You know, there are, like, some couples on the show where it's kind of obvious that the foreign fiancé is, like only here for that person and it and it kind of plays out in these funny ways like I'm thinking of this one couple from the most recent season Jovi and Yara and Yara is from the Ukraine and Jovi is an American guy from New Orleans and they're having a fight on the street and at one point Jovi says oh what you're just gonna go back to the Ukraine and she just looks at him and says yeah I'll go back I had a really nice life there and you can see that she's like not here on a lark. She's not here because she thinks that the United States is better than the Ukraine. She actually, you know, and she knows that there's a stereotype about Eastern European women and she's rejecting that. She's just literally here to be with this guy. So I just also like the show because it's always questioning your assumptions about people and what their motivations might be. Yeah, and it kind of raises the question, like, what what are the right reasons um, to be in this kind of relationship or yeah. really any, right? <laughs> and why does the American government even care that much? <laughs> you know, if people are scamming, let them scam each other and fall in love. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I already think I know the answer to this question, but Julia, do you think you will watch 90 Day Fiancé? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you watched it, so I don't have to. <laughs> All right. That's fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you.
This episode was produced by Tracy Hunt and me, Gabrielle Burbe, with editing by Catherine Wells, Emily Botin, and Julia Longoria. Fact check by William Brennan. Sound design by David Herman. Music by Tasty Morsels. Special thanks to Maeve Higgins. And extra special thanks to Matt Colette, who helped deliver this show into the world. This is his last episode. Matt, we will miss you. Go forth and conquer. We can't wait to hear what you'll make next. Our team also includes Natalia Ramirez and Alvin Mellif. The Experiment is a co-production of The Atlantic and WNYC Studios. Thanks for listening.